And thank you for the intro and the invitation to this seminar. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking about some of our methods that build um, data geometry and topology into machine learning frameworks for the purposes of basically extracting insights from biomedical data. So uh, in my lab, we actually encounter a lot of different kinds of data, uh, including um, single cell data, so single cell RNA-seq, ATAC-seq. Um, also, we have a lot of work that I'll talk less about today, uh, having to do with fMRI data, uh, some more uh, having to do with patient data. But there is something that is in common with all these data types. And that's that they're high throughput, high dimensional data sets where things aren't sort of neatly annotated or classified for you. And so the real questions are to understand something about the underlying biology of the system that's being measured. So this is really more of machine learning or AI for the purposes of discovery or discovering new insights. And this um, has provided us with a lot of challenges that we've tried to address. And some of the most successful techniques that we've found at analyzing these really try to look at the shape and the structure of the data. Some examples of techniques that we've uh, developed uh, include pro uh, problems in denoising data, just distilling and understanding the structure of the data, integrating multiple samples, and trying to learn the underlying dynamics from static snapshot models. And I'll talk a little bit about each of these goals and how we've gone about tackling them. And um, some of the mathematical methods that have come to help us uh, have to do with this idea that the data has some kind of intrinsic low dimensional uh, manifold that it lies on. And the idea here is that while the data is measured in high dimensions, that the relationship between the different features you're measuring actually restricts the data to a lower intrinsic dimensionality. And if you understand the intrinsic geometry of the data, then you'll be able to understand a lot about everything, including what's generating the data. And typically speaking, we've been uh, using a few different types of methods to understand the shape of the data. Uh, prominent um, class of methods we use are data geometry uh, methods. And in these, and you might know of some of these by way of nonlinear dimensionality reduction, here the data is turned into a fully connected graph uh, and then passed by an affinity matrix to give you something like a soft nearest neighbors um, matrix. On top of this, we've often found that computing random walk probabilities of going transitioning from one data point to another as if there was a person standing on a data point and jumping to nearby data points based uh, on probabilities inversely proportional to distance has been very useful because it restores global connectivity of the data but not randomly through the space but instead through the intrinsic manifold of the data. And If you create a matrix like this of random walk probabilities from one data point to another data point that is called a diffusion operator and it turns out that that has very nice properties. For example, if you eigen decompose the diffusion operator, you get the diffusion maps construct and the first non-trivial eigenvector, because this is a Markov matrix, could for example be the coiled intrinsic dimension of the data, kind of like your PC1 if it was all coiled up. And so we found these data geometry ideas very useful uh, in performing all kinds of different analyses. Um, more recently, we've also tried to use um, diffusion and diffusion-based filtering to process signals that lie on these data graphs. So you can think that, you know, I've rendered this data into a graph, and you guys have probably all heard that graph neural networks are just the coolest new thing in, in, in machine learning, but um, actually, um, even without necessarily using some of the GNN frameworks, you can actually process these signals, as you know from graph convolutional networks, that features on the vertices of these graphs are actually signals on this graph. And what you can actually do is take a Fourier transform of these signals by loading them back onto these eigenvectors. And that can help you separate noise from signal or process these as signals. Um, which is to uh, 
a somewhat more restricted extent what graph convolutional networks do. And finally, we do uh, involve deep neural networks to collect a lot of this information and learn more refined embeddings. And the main reason being that uh, neural networks are extensible. So these kinds of nonlinear dimensionality reduction methods, you can compute these eigenvectors, but you've done them on a fixed set of data. And if you see a new data point, there's not an easy way of plunking them in there. Whereas with a neural network that's perhaps regularized with data geometric constraints or things like that, you can put a new point in pretty easily, or you can train it with a more flexible uh, penalty. And so those are some of the main ideas that we've dealt with, and I'll cover specific projects that use these to various extents. Um, but if you have more questions on any of this, let me know. So one of the things I want to set up with is FATE. Uh, and some of you guys might have heard me talk about FATE before. But actually, I'm going to use FATE as a lead-in to um, motivating the need to, for actually uh, using all, not just geometry, but topology, which was the second part of my title. Um, so FATE is a visualization method that also learns data geometry. And it learns data geometry in a slightly different way than the diffusion maps construct does, even though it uses those steps. And the reason it's learning this data geometry is to be able to collect the information in very low dimensions, like two or three dimensions, which is what you need for visualization. So what we had noticed was that a lot of the methods out there are, are not really able to render high dimensional data and low dimensions faithfully. And sometimes it's because they leave out a lot of the variability by projecting down to low dimensions. Um, and you know PC2 through N are left out, but, and the PC1 and PC2 are not able to follow the nonlinear direction, so they miss a lot of details. Or they're just not preserving or calculating information about data geometry, something like TSNIR or UMAP really computes nearest neighbors and tries to preserve those. Um, or they may not be always denoising the vast amount of noise in this data. So to address these issues, we carefully designed FATE so that you go from uh, data points to a new notion of data geometry and a new notion of data distance. Just to go over the steps, we start with the data points and then we compute a pairwise distance matrix. So if you're looking at a point here, uh, these will have low distance and these will have high distance from them. We invert that through a very specific kernel we crafted called an alpha decay kernel. And this alpha, alpha decay kernel is adaptive, so it adapts out density deviations, and it has a very sharp drop-off. So you see that it inverts this, but has a sharp drop-off. Um, and so these are the points that are, that are close to it. And the reason we do this is so that then when we diffuse, we won't um, kind of diffuse into density ditches. So when we diffuse, we just have to Markov normalize this matrix and power it. And then we get t-step diffusion probabilities of all of these. And you see now this kind of expands where, where the data point can go in t-steps. It, it can go quite a few places right along the manifold. And so it's restoring global connectivity. Now each data point is represented as a t-step random walk probability distribution to all other data points. And this is actually globally contextualizing data the way that word vector embeddings do. And we define a new distance in this space, uh, which, is a, which is actually an information theoretic distance in the sense that it's a divergence. So this turns out to be an M divergence. And this new distance we can embed with MDS to preserve uh, what we've learned about in data geometry. But the key steps being that we log transform the diffusion probabilities into what we call the diffusion potential. And we have a distance that we call the potential distance. That is a very manifold intrinsic distance. So you may be asking, why do we need all these steps? Can we just skip like half of them? Um, it turns out not really, because distances don't really discover the intrinsic geometry of the data because they're, they're actually looking at the ambient Euclidean space that the data is embedded into. And they'll have cross-cutting connections. So then the affinity matrix matrices are OK, but they have these shortcut jumps as well. When you power the diffusion operator, you start um, emphasizing paths that really go through the manifolds. So this is really the effect of the powering. And now this step re-represents data. But if you just took a Euclidean distance between these two, you'd get the diffusion maps construct back, even, even if you used MDS. 
And the reason we want to damp these probabilities is we want to contextualize data points with far things as much as we do with nearby things. Um, and so we use these to squeeze into two dimensions. And now um, I can, because we've used some diffusion math steps, I'm just going to tell you how this is different than diffusion maps. Diffusion maps actually separate out trajectories into orthogonal dimensions. Diffusion component one basically follows this trajectory and is zero on all the rest of the data. Diffusion component two, this one. Uh, diffusion component three, sort of this one. But fate collects all those into low dimensions. So they're actually quite complementary to, to one another. Uh, and we've used fate on a number of things. Um, and most specifically, when we're really interested in the geometries, when we're interested in some kind of underlying biological pro process that might have progressions, branching, clustering, these kinds of things. Um, people some, are sometimes surprised to learn that FIT actually preserves clusters in our empirical data better than UMAP or TSNI, and the reason is because the distances between clusters in UMAP or TSNI is arbitrary, whereas fate is trying to still preserve distance. And when you have sparsity in your data, you'll often see artificial clusters emerge in, in UMAP or TSNI that you don't see in fate. Uh, and the reason is because uh, several, several of our steps keep the manifold geometry and we're able to study these kinds of branching processes or other processes. So this is on some data with specific cluster structure, retinal bipolar cells. So we see the three components you see in PCA, but you also see substructure here. And one of our questions as soon as we saw this substructure, and I'm foreshadowing here, is can't we zoom into this substructure and learn a lot more about this? And this is where I'll get to next. So fate uh, is also, I think, useful because the, preserving the data geometry makes you kind of try to understand what you want to do next. Like, do we want to analyze branch points? Do we want to go deeply into regions and find an ordering, et cetera? And of course, there's nothing to do necessarily with the data type I just spoke about. Some of you might be more interested in genetic data or genomic data, and you can use it on that too. Uh, the main idea being that Fate is trying to preserve manifold affinity in low dimensions. And we have a measurement called DE map that shows exactly what fate is uh, useful at doing. Uh, we believe that the Laplacian eigen map, initialization of U map, confers U map with some of these, but not all of these properties because the subsequent steps don't pay attention to the data geometry. So back to the question I was asking. So we saw all these structures in fate, but then we kind of see start to see substructures. Is there a way to go in and see what the additional substructure is? And we know that kind of intuitively that this should be the case in biology because biological entities are hierarchically organized with emergent properties coming up at all different time points. Um, and so for this, we took inspiration from topological data analysis. Topological data analysis, of course, comes from the pure math field of topology. Um, and here, algebraic topology in specific. And here we're interested in coming up with quanti quantitative descriptors of sort of abstract shapes. One such descriptor that's used, but not the only one, are these Beatty numbers, which characterize or basically count how many d-dimensional holes you have. Um, zero means zero dimensional hole. And what's a zero dimensional hole? I guess it's not a hole, it's how many connected components you have in your data. So this is all one connected component, if you can believe it. Um, a one dimensional hole is like a cycle. This doesn't have any cycles, but it does have a cavity as if you poked a hole into a baseball. So that's why you have a two dimensional hole. And I think you can figure out the same numbers in the torus here. So comp in computational homology, uh, you actually sweep through the levels of resolution as set by this resolution parameter epsilon. So you draw epsilon balls around data points, and when two balls overlap, you join them into a new connected component. And you can actually quantify when these different features emerge, and here we had a cycle emerge, um, and so on. And this actually gives you a multi-resolution characterization of the data. Uh, and we thought that that was very interesting uh, but in our experiments, it didn't work as well to find a lot of these features, and we reasoned that it's because it's not necessarily operating um, in the intrinsic manifold dimensions of the data like some of our manifold learning methods were. And so 
we have this method called diffusion topology that we're, um, we've been developing. And actually, we've just completed a very theoretical study of it that we'll probably put on archive uh, that shows mathematically its properties of convergence and things like that. So if you're interested in that kind of angle, let me know. I didn't include that in, in, in these slides. This actually already appeared in Nature, the, this particular slide. It's slide is old. Um, and so the idea here is the operation that you saw that was sweeping through the different levels of resolution, that's called a filtration. So can we perform a filtration in the diffusion space rather than in the ambient space of the data where things can contract to points that aren't quite in the data space? Um, so what we sought to do was use our knowledge of signal processing on, on the manifolds to come up with this kind of low pass filter that could serve as a way of grouping data points or sort of condensing them together. So if somebody has read our earlier paper, Magic, it turns out magic is sort of one iteration of this kind of condensation. So it's removing one level of variability of the data. But what we do here is we remove that one level of variability and then we recompute the diffusion operator. Just like in uh, topological data analysis, you kind of recompute the graph after you have these uh, components. And again, what you're doing both in magic and in every iteration of diffusion condensation is low pass filtering the data and killing some high frequency noise. So in magic, after one iteration of it, we were able to show that it denoises data and restores trends in data. So this is data that didn't have dropout. We added it, and then we imputed it with magic, and it restores nonlinear trends in data. But here we want to do this over and over again to systematically eliminate variability and coarse grain the data uh, on the manifold. Um, and so you'll see here a small simulation where you have these three clusters of data points. These can correspond um, to, for example, let's say immune cells, T cells, B cells, innate immune cells, something like that. That's the level of granularity that a lot of immunologists might be thinking of, but we're thinking of all these levels of granularity in between. And there could be a really meaningful level of granularity like the one where uh, purple is one dot, blue is one dot, and yellow is one dot. We don't know that a priori in these biological systems that we're just exploring. So that's a little bit how the condensation works. At the end of the day, you do come up with this continuous tree where the branch lengths have meaning. And we're, we've been exploring a number of data sets with that. Um, one of the first data sets we explored with that uh, was these uh, neurons in the C. elegans worm. The worm only has 200 something neurons and when you apply this condensation process to it with an affinity ba matrix that's based on actual proximity of the uh, neurons with each other, physical proximity in imaging uh, data set, we come up with sort of a complete picture of the organization of the neurons. So in specific, our collaborator, Daniel Colon Ramos, and the members of his lab were able to identify additional neurons and circuits uh, that had been somewhat characterized before, but maybe not completely. So, he, so when I say complete picture, I'm claiming that the condensation goes all the way down to the end level of granularity. And I used to wonder if that was the case, but recently we've proven that this process actually converges to one single point and that it converges in a rate that's proportional to whatever your, we have two different proofs, rate that's proportional to how much connectivity your kernel uh, sends out. Uh, so we have some confidence that we, we get what we think. Um, so when we recently worked together with a different collaborator, also in neuroscience, but this time in neurodegeneration, we were looking at retinal cell types. So the retina actually has neuronal cell types and it has some immune cell types. One of the things we noticed was that the most persistent of these clusters are the major cell types, uh, but they're not all equal and abundant, so they actually emerge at different levels of granularity. So then when we compare between people who are healthy and people who have a neurodegenerative disease called age-related macular degeneration, we see that they're kind of enriched in these two um, types of cells, microglia and astrocytes. So then what we can do is we can zoom into these basically by going down in the condensation tree 
And then there's three other clusters that emerge that are differentially enriched. And in particular, cluster one turns out it's enriched um, earlier in the disease. So um, there's, sorry, I said that wrong. Cluster two is um, enriched earlier in the disease. You see the cluster two is the one in the orange and it's the one that's enriched in the early part of the disease. So the really interesting thing to us was we then looked at publicly available data, single cell data on Alzheimer's disease and multiple sclerosis, which are actually different neurodegenerative disease with different manifestations, so retina versus brain. But we actually were able to see the same cluster that we'd identified also enriched here, but that the signatures didn't persist if we looked at the whole microglial uh, population. So that was really interesting to us. So that tells us that this is a potential way of finding biomarkers and early biomarkers. So since then, we've gone on to sort of validate this and also similarly sweep through populations of astrocytes and find mechanisms of communication between those two specific cell types. Since this is a bioinformatics venue, I'm not going to go into that, but a lot of that is covered in the bioarchive that we have on that. Instead, I'm going to tell you another application we have of this kind of topology and geometry combination we have. It's called multi-scale fate, and I was just told that this is coming in, out in Nature Biotechnology on Monday, so watch out for that. Um, multi-scale fate combines condensation with the visual exploration ability of something like fate. So in regular fate, you might see these uh, cell types, you know, in one level of granularity, but this is asking the question again, can we zoom in? We seem to see additional structure here and there's something going on here. And that's exactly what multi-scale fate allows you to do. It allows you to go in and zoom in and explore. And the way you look at these plots is actually each of these is a clustering or a coarse graining of the data at one level of resolution of the condensation. And so you're getting clustering and visualization both at the same time. And we are again able to show uh, using DE map that multi-scale fate uh, keeps manifold affinity at whatever level of coarse graining that you're doing and that it's actually pretty fast because after some levels of coarse graining of the data it gets faster and faster so it's not ultimately uh, slower than regular fate it's actually um, with some tricks even faster um, so we applied multi-scale fate to a very exciting COVID-19 data set from Yale New Haven Hospital uh, in a collaboration with Akiko Iwasaki and the whole COVID impact team at Yale. And here we had 219 patients who were admitted to Yale New Haven Hospital uh, for COVID um, and cells were measured from each patient with flow cytometry panels. So it's not single cell RNA sequencing, but rather flow cytometry. And we measured several different panels on those. Um, and these panels all had like eight to 10 markers. Um, and so this is what the PBMC panel, and this is all the cells, millions and millions of cells. But I can show you millions of cells here because this technique coarse grains the data. So you don't get like your whole um, um, screen kind of uh, crowded with, with cells such that you can't tell their structure. Here we used a different technique that we have in my lab that I don't have time to talk about called MELD that quantifies the likelihood that such cells come from patients who died or patients who ultimately got better and survived. And so we call this a mortality likelihood score. And so we want to see what those cells, cells are. Um, and so we see that at a different level of course screening, it looks like that. And you can look at which cell types are specific by zooming in. When you zoom in, for example, on with particular cell types, you see new cell types emerge. For example, if you zoomed in on the monocytes, you see um, several subtypes of monocytes that emerge, um, CD14+, plus, 16 minus, 14 minus, 16 plus, double positive, etc. And only some of these turn out that are enriched in people with mortality. And one of the popula one of the populations we found that had the highest association with mortality was this one, this CD14 um, minus CD16 plus monocyte subcluster. And it had a very high likelihood with uh, people who uh, died from COVID. 
So this gives you a way of kind of scoring or ranking subpopulations uh, for their predictability. T cells was also another interesting story. The overall number of T cells is associated with good outcomes. But if you go into the T cells and you zoom in, you'll see specific kinds of T cells like these red ones that are basically bad T cells. And they also have an elevated association uh, about 5% about 5% over um, other types of T cells in uh, how associated they are with mortality. So we were able to find that subpopulations sometimes had the opposite trend of the whole population in terms of the association. And then we were able to take a bunch of features like this and create a whole patient manifold. And you see that this patient manifold is nicely organized. These are the people who survived, these are the people who died, and these are the people who needed rehab or did some uh, had some other things. And here are the associations via a mutual information plot called DREAMY. The T cell association versus the T cell of this population, which is not a canonical population, but one that condensation together with multi-scale fate helped identify has the opposite association uh, with that. So what we're able to actually do is come up with a ranking or scoring and discovery of several of these populations. So we found several of these populations and we were actually able to classify from that um, how well a, um, a person's going to do after the treatment based on uh, initial measurements of their uh, facts data. So um, this, is, this is sort of exciting to us and does suggest some clinical applications, although we, we haven't follow, followed up on that. Um, the final thing that I kind of wanted to talk about was the dynamics. So, so far I've just talked to you about um, these cellular subtypes as static entities. You just measure a person, here you go. But that's not true. Humans and our cells are constantly evolving. They're, they're kind of dynamic entities. Um, and we've been developing a technique, the first iteration of which appeared in 2020 in ICML, called trajectory net to actually track what happens to these cellular populations in time. Um, so the motivation for this is to be able to predict maybe what happens at times when you don't measure it, because when you measure single cell data in time, it's often very coarse grained. Weeks, uh, for example, some longitudinal measurements of those COVID patients happen at weak intervals. Um, for our embryoid body data that I showed you, it happens on the order of days. But you know, you want to know what the continuous dynamic trajectory is. And you also might want to know what happens to a cell as it progresses? Where does it go? What happens to the fate of the cell? So one way you can think about this is in terms of flowing probability distributions to each other. Because obviously you killed all the cells you measured, especially when you take them out of the person and you use them in a measurement device, they're done. Um, so you want to think about this population of cells as flowing into another population of cells. And there are constructs like these in machine learning, specifically in normalizing flows. Normalizing flows were previously used as generative models to go from something like a simple distribution, like a Gaussian distribution, to your distribution of data. The way that works in literature is you begin with a simple distribution, you apply invertible transformations, and you use a change of variables to calculate the probability of uh, in your other distribution, and you can you know, use uh, basically this direction to actually compute how it is, but you're penalizing log likelihood in this direction. This is why you need reversibility here. Um, there's also deep normalizing flows, but actually the breakthrough came in 2018 uh, where uh, David Dunod's lab, uh, who's I think at Toronto, uh, came up with continuous normalizing flows. Continuous normalizing flows are a way of continuously transporting one population to another. These are really great, except for they're not very well constrained for the purposes of biology. Um, so they can create continuous paths, but these paths aren't very restricted. They could give you implausible paths or circuitous paths. So we sought to constrain them using a biological principle. What we wanted to do is make the paths sort of as straight as possible while still fitting the continuous dynamics. So not to piecewise linear approximate them, but try to encourage them to be as straight as possible. And the way we did that was actually to take this neural ODE, and the neural ODE, what it actually learns is a derivative. And then you can just penalize the magnitude of that derivative. And so just to step back a little bit, these continuous normalizing flows are in implemented 
by what are called neural ODE networks. Neural ODE networks actually compute the derivative penalized by a neural network, and they use an ODE solver to match a function, which is you know, the derivative integrated over time. And so because we're using a neural ODE, we can just tell the function to change as little as possible over time. So when we do that, what we get, and we can prove this, it, or the proofs in the paper, is you get something called dynamic optimal transport. Dynamic optimal transport um, is this kind of setup, which is an extension of the regular optimal transport. In regular optimal transport, you move one distribution to another so that the displacement has the least amount of ground distance. But here you're also looking at the path of displacement. And this path of displacement is also penalized with an infimum, basically. Um, and here in the neural network, we can achieve this if we make sure that the marginals are maintained. So in a regularized CNF where we have this regularization in, we just need to make sure that the marginals are equal to the end time point distributions where we want to look at. So this look, what, what does this actually look like? It kind of looks like flowing from one distribution to another distribution in the most efficient way possible. So if you want to take this cloud and flow it to an S, you don't have this kind of wasteful slidey movement, but you go directly where it belongs on the S. And we call this, for that region, re reason, an energy regularization. So energy regularizations are really good because you can also already you know, do a lot with them in, far, in as far as mimicking biological systems. But of course, we know even more about cellular systems. Um, for, so for example, cells don't just transport from state to state. They also die and they also grow. So we actually used an unbalanced factor uh, together with this. And more recently, we've trained trajectory net to have a separate neural network that actually learns the growth or proliferation rate of every cell through your trajectory. The second thing is that when you're um, inferring continuous trajectories of cells, what you want that trajectory to do is go over the cellular manifold. So you don't want anything transported like this, because likely the time points that we've collected all flow along this kind of manifold. So actually, we can enforce that too through a density penal penalization that penalizes the distance to the kth nearest neighbor along the paths. So when we include uh, these two penalties, we get um, growth and death, and we get transport through the manifold. But the third one um, was a way of incorporating these instantaneous velocities that came out of this exciting literature uh, from you know, a couple of different labs. Um, I think um, this is from the Karchenko lab and the Fabian Tice lab uh, with instantaneous rates of change called velocity that you can actually detect from spliced versus unspliced transcripts. So where, but you might have to notice that these are just instantaneous uh, instantaneous arrows, and they're not going to be reliable when there's gaps in the manifold or really large gaps in time points where populations are rapidly evolving, like your immune system. So where they're available, we'll penalize to agree with them. And so these are the additional properties of cells that are respected by these additional regularizations. And with those in place, we can transport cells on the manifold in a way that respects any kind of information we have about instantaneous rates of change. So you might be asking me, you know, how can we actually use this? So this is some preliminary use, use case on the same COVID data that I previously showed you, uh, where we can start to see um, we have now single cell trajectories. So we can actually plot genes continuously in time over clusters of cells. And th these can be clusters of cells that are enriched in um, sick patients or healthy patients or those subclusters that I talked to you about. And you'll get this kind of average trajectory of genes over them. And we can start to see which genes deviate the earliest. And how can we use this information to also make predictions and prognosis? And this is where we're at right now. And we're also trying to use this to understand cancer progression and many, many other things uh, as part of our ongoing work.
Uh, happy to chat with anyone about how we're doing, what the changes we're making to these systems are. So we have a lot of other number of works like this in our lab um, that are using you know, deep learning together with things we've learned from data geometry and topology, uh, including you know, domain alignment, uh, factor analysis, and also kind of using a different combination of data geometry and topology. So we could actually learn topological features first and then plot them over time in some kind of trajectory. Um, so if you have any questions about any of this, let me know. And if you want to check out any of our code, just, just go to our GitHub. All right, thank you.